let's continue our igniting theme, amen. At our 11 o'clock service, I mean, Minister Levon is preaching. Uh, Minister Levon from Ku is preaching. And uh, uh, so if you don't get the opportunity to stay over for a double dose, I encourage you to uh, listen to her sermon later on this week and hear what God has placed on her heart for our congregation. Uh, she's a wonderful, wonderful woman of God, wonderful preacher, wonderful advocate around uh, healing trauma and um, ending victimization and surviving. Amen. And so I hope that you get a chance to uh, listen to her sermon. For this 9 a.m. service, I'm going to continue to stay in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 as we work through this theme of igniting and invite you to uh, head with me to uh, 1 Corinthians 3 verses 9. Uh, uh, through 15. I think I'm actually uh, just in the, to help provide the context, because many of you may not have memorized the Bible yet. How many of you have, have not done that yet? Amen. All right. Thank God. Amen. You have the rest of your life to do so. Amen. But until then, we'll just keep reading. Isn't that all right? Amen. Uh, we'll keep reading, and so we don't have to memorize it all. But uh, 1 Corinthians is one of Paul's letters that he wrote to the church in Corinth, and this has been uh, one of, I think, the, the most drama-filled, contentious congregations. They had all kind of funny uh, ideas, various ideas, various belief systems, cultural collisions happening all over the place. And yet at the center of this church's life, Paul's admonition was to keep Jesus foundational, to keep reminding one another that the work that we all are doing flows out of a deep commitment to Jesus. It's not a deep commitment necessarily to uh, your ideological claims, to the multitude of your experiences, to the kind of music you like, to the kind of food you want to eat. All of that stuff is good. Don't matter about your boo, don't matter about how you identify, all of that's okay. But Paul is trying to encourage the church in Corinth Keep Jesus as the foundation because if Jesus is your foundation, all of your difference will find a way to fit neatly together because Jesus is big enough to take all of that. Amen. I don't know about you, but that's some good news. Amen. In a world that loves to divide us, Jesus is always inviting us to use the foundation he gives us as a way to make it all fit together. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today. It's about using what you have. As we are igniting and building and trying to unleash our gifts and growth, it's important for you to remember that you are not starting from zero. That you have lots of materials that God can use to build up God's kingdom, both in you, in your family, community, and certainly in the church. And so 1 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, I'll just uh, recap us. I'll start at verse number 5. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Remember we were talking about this. People were set tripping about Paul and Apollos. And just like folks set tripping about Baptists and Methodists and Pentecostal and Presbyterian and Catholic. People would be set tripping and using their titles and their, 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 their descriptions that in ways that keep us distracted away from who we are all called to follow. Right? Servants, Paul and Apollos, they're servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, this is Paul talking, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. Somebody say amen. So our text today, just giving you a little bit of background so you just don't have to jump into the cold part of the pool. Amen. Got you a little warmed up. Tell your neighbor, I'm warmed up. I think I know where we're at. Amen. I'm going to switch to the message translation because I like this translation, particularly for what I'm believing the scripture is wanting to give to us today. Starting at verse 10, the scripture picks up. It says, you are God's house. Everybody say, I am God's house. Say it again. I am God's house. Using the gift that God gave me as a good architect, I design blueprints. This is Paul talking. Apollos is putting up the walls. 
Let each carpenter or builder who comes on this job take care to build on the foundation. Remember, there is only one foundation, the one already laid, Jesus Christ. Amen. That's some good stuff. Amen. Let's keep reading. So take particular care in picking out your building materials. Eventually, there is going to be an inspection. Mm -hmm. Some versions say testing. Amen. But inspection is a little less ominous. Amen. For some of us who are test averse. Uh -huh. If you use cheap or inferior materials, you'll be found out. The inspection will be thorough and rigorous. You won't get by with a thing. Oh, my. If your work passes inspection, fine. If it doesn't, your part of the building will be torn out and started over. But you won't be torn out. You'll survive. But just barely. Amen. Word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. Again, we're going to talk from the topic, use what you have. God bless the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. I ask you to hide this word in our heart so we will not sin against you. And bless the words that we have heard. I pray, God, that they will be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. amen. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them, use what you have. Use what you have. <laughs> Pat yourself on the chest and say, I've got what it takes. Say that to yourself, I've got what it takes. Now, I want to ground again this message in a wonderful quote from Howard Thurman, who is one of the most significant Christian mystics, particularly here in African American Black History Month. Howard Thurman, I think, is a precursor to much of the black kind of spirituality that was transcendent uh, across kind of denomination and even faith. You know, Howard Thurman was one of these folk who really had this kind of mystic uh, kind of um, uh, 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 spirituality that, that was able to tap into the divine and the knowledge and the wisdom of the divine. And Howard Thurman, he says like this, don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive. And then go do that. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. Don't ask the world, or don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself, what makes you come alive? And then go do that. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. came out of Jeremiah chapter 1. It's one of my most favorite passages. It is the call passage, the call narrative of Jeremiah, who was one of the prophets in the uh, history of Israel, particularly in the biblical text. The scripture says that before Jeremiah was formed in his mother's womb, scripture says, God said, I knew you. That God's relational connection to you predates your arrival. He goes on to say that I have chosen you and I have consecrated you. I have appointed you to be my instrument, my prophet. And he goes on to just give Jeremiah a couple warnings about how people are going to push against you. People are going to hate on you. People are going to have all kinds of terrible things to say about you. The systems of the world are going to try and crush that which I've already seen and placed in you. But he tells Jeremiah, do not fear because I will be with you. I love that passage, and I almost preached that passage last week because when I preach Jeremiah, you know, I start running around and hollering and shaking a mic and getting one, you know, because Jeremiah, that's some good stuff. 
So I'm not going to be able to do all that this morning, amen, because time and, you know, other things uh, get in the way. Somebody say amen. But I wanted to invoke Jeremiah as a part of how I want you to understand the divine contribution God has already placed within you before you even get started. That you show up in the world with a divine deposit. Something that is unique to you, something that no one else can duplicate, replicate, or even diminish. That at the end of the day, the greatest obstacle to your greatness and your contribution is more often you than anyone else. Because God has put in you without any regret. The scripture says the gifts of God are without repentance. Which means that God never regrets what God places in you. That it is as uh, God was like, you know, I gave McBride that gift. I gave him that gift. And I don't regret it. Now I could do a whole lot with this gift. And God may regret what I do with the gift, but God never regrets giving me this gift. Could it be, child of God, that one of the most important opportunities we have as followers of Jesus is to get clear about our gifts? Get clear about the unique things that God has placed within you that brings you alive without much effort. <laughs> now, you know, many of us have skills that over time we've had to hone. And even though, you know, we were a natural at honing the skill, sometimes executing that skill takes everything out of you. Anybody had that experience before? It's like, you know, I, 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 you know, I'm just gifted to doing this, you know. And then there are some things that you do that you would do it if nobody paid you to do it. It's like, I just let her do this, you know. I know folk who love to cook. And it's like, you know, they spend their, their much of their time, for them it's just therapeutic. Or it's just like, ooh, ooh, I just feel like cooking a pound cake today. And I thank God for these people. <laughs> Especially when they call me. I'd be like, oh, yes. Move in your gift, praise God. Do it with a lot of love. I know people who are gifted in giving counsel to folks. I mean, they, they, they work on a job and they hate their job, but when they get in a group of people and folks need some wisdom or some guidance, it just comes out of them without any effort. But because of how and where they were reared in their life and the opportunities afforded to them, they got pushed into, you know, I don't know, a different kind of profession, but there's a part of them that really naturally makes them and others come alive without effort. I want to suggest to you, child of God, that very few of us will have the privilege to work every day of our lives in our giftings that Bring us joy without much effort. But we all will have an opportunity as a part of God's community of believers to figure out how can I bring that contribution into a community that allows my gifting to be exponentially beneficial. I want you to think about this whole idea, particularly in this text, that God is calling the church, God's people, more specifically the way, to imagine what is your and our natural gift that brings you alive, that you may not be paid for Monday through Friday, but that you are able to contribute into the lives of people, your family, your community, that can help put the world back on the right track. 
Because I often tell my young comrades, you know, who just kind of got woke like last week, praise God, you know, uh, you know, pr the professionalization of woke folk, amen, of activism is a fascinating thing. Don't you know that most of the work that's happened both in the church, in society, in the, in the, the, the social and political context, most people do not get paid for the work that actually revolutionizes the world. You know, Black History Month, you know, I use this as a great example. There are all these churches that were being founded as a result of the white American church excluding black folk, indigenous folk, from being full worshipers in their churches. But did you know that when the AME church started and the CME church started and the Church of God in Christ started and, 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 and some of these, these black church denominations started, they didn't have a church planting plan. <laughs> they didn't have a budget to go start them a church. They didn't have a marketing budget. They didn't have a, 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 a production budget. They didn't have a preacher budget. They had themselves. <laughs> and the Holy Ghost that was on the inside of them. Some natural gifts that maybe they could not use Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday because of the racism and the human hierarchy at work in the society. But they realized that there's more to me than what the society says is valuable. And so they carved out their own communities that allowed their speaking gifts and their music gifts and their teaching gifts and their familial gifts and their artistic gifts to be used and it created arguably one of the most enduring prophetic transformational institutions in the history of this country that arguably has been one of the primary catalysts for making this country more just. Yeah. You will not get paid for your natural gifts to be used in the service of God at the rate you deserve, except if you, you know, think that life is a good payment you know, oxygen, <laughs> somebody say amen. <laughs> I mean, if that's not good enough for you, then, you know, I, I understand. But I tell the comrades all the time, no one can pay you enough for the liberation of your soul, your mind, or your family. At the end of the day, all of that will always be a work of love. Part of what I want to give you as an opportunity to lean into as we're launching live groups and we're trying to expand and grow and, 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 and get into our gifts. I, I, the first thing I want you to appreciate is that you must discover and trust the gifts God has placed within you. Somebody say discover. discover. Somebody say trust, trust. your gifts. Trust. Say it again, discover and trust your gifts. I am just like Jermaine. Most times when I get up to preach or speak, I get real nervous. Butterflies, I forget what I'm going to say. I often say to myself, what if this bombs? And so I just be, I just, I, you know, there's about, it used to be about 30 seconds. Now it's down to like maybe, you know, two seconds. I just got to get going. And I've been doing this for a little while. Part of what I have learned is that it took me a while to discover what God had placed in me. And then it took another process to trust those gifts as well. You are a walking gift. You are priceless. There is, no, there is no number that can fully exhaust your value. That is how I want you every day to wake up and appreciate 
the possibility of what you bring to the world. And you may be around some shady folks, some broken folk, some folk who are a little kind of messed up themselves, and they may not treat you as well as your gift deserves. But you must commit yourself to discovering your gifts. In the text, the first thing Paul says, using the gift God gave me. Who gave Paul the gift? God. What was Paul's responsibility? To use the gift. In this year of igniting, you have a responsibility to use the gift God gave you. You don't have a responsibility to be obsessed necessarily with the outcome because as we see at the end of this passage, even if you mess up, all you got to do is start over. Because you are the most important gift that has been given. Are you tracking with what I'm saying? There is a gift that God has given. It starts with you, but you must discover and trust that gift, which makes you alive. Why? Because when you are alive, you are helping to bring everything around you alive. So, you know, I, I will spend a little bit more time on that, but I, I got about four or five things I want to just lift up today, amen. I usually do three, but I, I got five, amen. So I'm, I'm just going to give y'all a little bit of a nugget or two, and hopefully you'll latch on to one of these. But the first question, have you examined what lives at the intersection of your gifts and what brings you alive? Sometimes you are so caught in the routine of your refined skill that you have not yet asked what brings me alive. And I'm not telling you to quit your job to tomorrow and be like, Pastor said that I don't have to go to work because you ain't paying me what I deserve. <laughs> I'm not telling you to do that. I'm telling you to advocate for yourself, of course, I'm telling you to bring your gifts with joy, but have you yet discovered what brings you alive? Every one of us have something that God has placed within you, just like he told Jeremiah before you were formed in your mother's womb, I put something in you, and that thing I placed in you can bring you alive. Now the question is, do you know what it is? Because it's hard to use something that you don't know about. You're moving in your skill set, you've refined, but is there another gift that can help bring you alive? In the biblical text, uh, you know, back in the day here at The Way, we used to do these spiritual gift tests. How many were here when we did those some years ago? And, and we may have to bring it back, I don't know. I love the United Methodist Church's uh, spiritual gift assessments because they are, you know, very interestingly uh, practical. But if you were to read the gifts of the Spirit or the fruit of the Spirit, I'm just going to read you some principles, some ideas. See if any of these things resonate to you. The gift of wisdom, understanding, counseling, Fortitude, you have, meaning you have the ability to keep pushing through. You ever been around some folk and they give up real quick? And you're like, come on now. You're just like, I can't. You're like, what? You're like, I can't. You're like, what? You're like, okay, well, I'll see you when I lap you a couple times. You have the gift of fortitude, knowledge, piety, the fear of the Lord, or the fruit of the Spirit, charity. That's a deep abiding love. You have the capacity to love folk without effort. It takes effort for me to love some folk. All right, so you don't have that gift. Amen. If you are, amen, 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 amen. You don't got that gift. It's okay. That's why you should hook up with some folk who do. Amen. Somebody say amen. Amen. Because, you know, some of the folk I'm around, I, I have people on my team strategically placed. Like, Pastor Tanisha is one of those folks here at the way. Like, she, she, she'll love you, you know, and, you know, your breath could be stinking, and she'll just figure out a way to tell you in just a way that just made you be like, thank you for telling me that. Yeah. Other folks just be like, man, your breath is humming. You just be like, <laughs> <laughs> just a kind of, you know, trivial example. But you know folk like that who are in your life, and they can love you through almost anything. All right, I'm getting bogged down on love. Maybe somebody need to hear that. Joy, 
peace. You have the ability to have peace in whatever situation. Think about how that gift could be at play in your family, Madari, in your community. Patience, Lord, have mercy. Kindness, goodness, temperance, faith, chastity, self-control. I'm curious, again, have you examined what lives at the intersection of your gifts and what brings you alive? And how much of your life, listen, is being animated by your gifts as you put them into practice? I believe that part of what is happening in our society is we are being pushed to have to work harder to survive rather than to be alive. Could it be that we have bought into this false sense of what it means to live? I gotta just work 40, 50, 60, 70 hours, we can pay for this mortgage, make sure my kids get in private school, make sure I, my car work, make sure I got health care, and I'm just gonna work, 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 until nobody likes me, I don't like myself, because I don't have any time to take, I don't know, three, four, six, eight hours a week to do what makes me alive. In community with other people who are doing that which makes them alive. I often, I used to preach a message some time ago called Less is More. That sometimes we have to continue to challenge ourselves, Lord help me to be in touch with the part of me that makes me and others come alive. Second thing, or couple second, couple things I want to lift up. First, you got to build on the foundation, and then you have to build with care. Let me start with build on the foundation. Understand, child of God, the scripture says that no one can build or lay any foundation other than the one that has been already laid, Jesus Christ. The first thing when you start building is you have to consider what are you building on. Now, it is a great gift that you and we are building on Jesus. <laughs> now, again, I'm not talking about the light skin, you know, blonde hair, blue eye, Michelangelo looking like with a bad perm, Jesus, that loves to be used to help bring all kind of moral cover for colonizing and imperialism and murder and rape and racism and sexism and human I'm not talking about that, Jesus. Somebody say amen. amen. That foundation is the foundation that most empires build their foundation on. They may not call it Jesus, but any foundation that makes you and I okay harming others is not the foundation that Jesus has left us. So when we say build on the foundation that is Jesus, it makes a difference which Jesus we're talking about. Woo. Because there's a whole lot of Jesuses running around out here. Somebody say amen. Man, it's like, I don't know that Jesus. I don't know who you're talking about. And that's fine. You can call that Jesus Jesus if you want to. But that ain't the Jesus I'm talking about. How many know in this country we got to define which Jesus we're talking about? And you better be clear about which Jesus you're building your life on now. Because the Jesus that we are talking about has a foundation that never forces God's ways using violence, manipulation, coercion. If Jesus is bringing life, then what we are producing should end death. So this is a good criteria. How do I know I'm building on this Jesus foundation? Is it life-giving? Does it bring you life? Does it bring the people around you life? Or is it diminishing them? Is it causing them to rethink about their value? So it's so important to appreciate that you and I are called to build on this foundation. Why? Because it helps this foundation to put the world on the right setting. All this injustice in the land is because we are building our lives on the wrong foundation. 
All this internal turmoil you have is because the foundation that is life-giving, that is love, that is creative, that never steals and robs, but always adds. That foundation, who would not want to have that foundation? I want that foundation. And guess what? I want to be around folk building on that foundation. Here at The Way, this is the foundation we are attempting to be more faithful to. The ways of Jesus, the life of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus. This is the foundation. Now be clear, the life of Jesus is only revealed through the life of the church. I won't say only, but primarily revealed through the life of the church. Because Jesus is not physically here, you know, I hope you realize that. Jesus has been kept alive by the faithful. And I know there are a lot of us who are suspicious about who those folk are, but I just tell you all the time, if you're suspicious about them, be suspicious about yourself. Because most of these folk is just like us, struggling to try to figure out how to be faithful. I know there's a few folk with a lot of power who are always manipulating, but I don't give those folk more power than the God of all creation. <laughs> Somebody say amen. Oh, they developed this thing in a laboratory in the corners of Europe in a big old palace to oppress all people. Wow. I guess God just took, you know, the rest of God's eternal life off while they was doing all that. Have you ever, you know, how many, y'all, some of y'all got kids. Have you ever watched your child try to do sneaky things? <laughs> you know, you tell them don't do something and they, they just be trying to sneak and then you have to come in and ensure the, the ending you want. Some of y'all don't have no kids. So you know what I'm talking about. I see, but just keep living. Or, or how about it? Take care of somebody else's kids. You will understand real quick. Don't watch TV. Okay. So then they go get an iPad. And they're watching iPads or phones. But it's not a TV. It's like... Yes, you know deep in your sanctified heart <laughs> the result I am asking. So because you sneaky and you manipulative, I'm going to have to like, you know, take everything and ensure the end that I want. That's how I want you to think of God. God gives us instructions. And because we are sneaky, manipulative, greedy, self-absorbed, full of fear, anger, unresolved pain, and trauma, we take God's good instructions and we do our own little kind of mixed up, messed up thing. And God has to often come back into the picture and ensure a certain result. God's church exist still because God has been ensuring that there will always be a group of people called and moved by God's spirit to gather and struggle with putting the kingdom back together again. And so the question you and I must ask, can we ensure we're building on the foundation? Second thing, can you build with care? Be careful how you build, the scripture says. If you don't build with care, you'll take all kinds of things that don't deserve to be in your house. Or you'll, you know, when, I, 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 we, when we, we moved into our house, we bought our house off of foreclosure. <coughs> 2012 or 13, 14, one of them years. I think it was 12. But, you know, it looks so great. Ooh, it's like, man, we got us a deal. Then we got in our house, and I came home one day, and water was shooting out of my house. And I got out of my car, you know, just kind of moved in. And the neighbors, people coming out their house, like, what well, we got old faithful in the neighborhood. I mean, just water just shooting up. And, I, you know, I don't know what to do. I called Brother Bill. I was like, Doc, I got water shooting out of my house. He was like, Pastor Mike, go turn the water. I was like, Doc, I'm this big old house. I don't know what to do with this thing. So 
30 minutes just water shooting out the house and I'm in the neighborhood with new people and everybody's kind of like wow you know that I, it's interesting so you know a guy came over and he was just kind of trying to I think made me feel good and so the, the, the plumber came and we all sitting there talking and the guy who was there before me said I remember the guy who was building this house and I remember I came and talked to him and he told me he was running out of money and so you know, that was, I was like, oh, okay, well, that's interesting. I didn't, you know, I was like, you know, all up in my business, man, get back over in your house and stop talking to me about my house. I paid for this foreclosed house. And so uh, the plumber, you know, got deep down into, he dug up some, some of the dirt, and he got in there, and he looked at the piping that they were using, and it was the cheapest material, but it was under the dirt. So I didn't even know. I didn't even see it. Not like if I did see it, I would know, because I don't know. It's like, you know, it was shiny. I was like, everything that glitter ain't gold. Touch your neighbor, amen. <laughs> but he told me, you know, because your house is on a hill, your house is always moving. I said, what? <laughs> he said, because it's moving, you have to have certain kinds of materials to ensure that the shifts happening in your house does not destroy what is under the ground. Ooh, I felt like preaching. I almost spoke in another tongue. I just, I just filed that away. I said, this is a great sermon point. The scripture says, be careful how you build. Some of us, are building using materials not worthy. It does not match the pressure, the purpose, the gifting. And when life starts to shift because of your gifting, your calling, just life, all that stuff on the ground that you didn't know was cheap will break. That's why you have to build with care. Be careful how you build this house, your house. Be careful how you use your gift. Be careful who cultivates your gifts. All of it is not equal. If it's on sale, there's probably a reason no one's bought it yet. I don't mean no harm. Folk boycotting Gucci, but ain't nobody really own no real Gucci. I'm trying to figure out what, so you, you gonna start boycotting the fake Gucci stuff you got? Somebody say that? You know you can still wear that, because they not responsible. <laughs> Y'all excuse me, I'm sorry. I got a little petty, amen. Build with care. Build with care. Your ministry, build it with care. Your family, your relationships. This, this community where we're trying, you gotta build it with care. Don't be reckless. I'm just gonna just pull, just pull everything in because it's all equal. No, it's not equal. Some things don't deserve to be built into your house. Oh, I'm running out of time. I'm going to have to pick this up next week. Are you building something worthy of honor that lasts? That's a question I want you to think about. As we get into live groups, as we lean into our gifts this year, as we're trying to ignite growth, what are you spending your time building? Is it honorable? Will it outlast you? I want to be a part of something that will outlast me. One of the reasons I like being a part of a church is because it will outlast me. One of the reasons why I like being a part of a family or community of loved ones is because that love will outlast me. My children, prayerfully, hopefully, will outlast me. That is a production of me and Sharice's love. Your family unit, however you construct it, it should outlast you. What you produce should outlast you. Don't be so focused on now that everything you produce dies when you die. That is not honorable. Think of Jesus. When Jesus died, everything Jesus did outlasted him. 
could it be there is an opportunity for you and I to build with what we have <coughs> and allow what we have to make us alive. Come on, stand with me, everyone. I, I, I like to close us out in prayer. Grab the hand of someone if you don't mind. Lord, I pray for the person I'm touching right now. They are a gift. Squeeze their hand gently. They are a gift, God. I squeeze purpose and meaning into these hands. I touch them with love, the love that you've touched me with, and I extend that animating love to them. A love, God, that brings their gifts alive. I pray, God, that as we move into seasons of life groups and ministry spaces, God, that every space we move into will be used as a vehicle to bring people alive. May they peel back all of the places in their life, Lord God, that sucks life out of them. Even if they have to go to a job they don't like, even if they be in a relationship that is difficult, even if their children are causing them all kinds of, 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 of challenges, even if their physical body, their mental, spiritual, emotional state does not feel stable, I pray, God, that that which brings them alive can be unleashed in the name of Jesus. Not for a purpose of profit, not for a purpose of utility, but for the purpose of just being your house. A house, Lord God, where life happens. I pray, God, that healing will come from their gifts. I pray that Love will come from their gifts. Clarity. Anointing. Production. God, may it come from their gifts. May they discover and nurture these gifts. May they be reminded that before they were formed in their mother's room, God, there was a gift that can never be erased. Lord, and I'm standing in the need of prayer. It is not my mother, nor my father, nor my sister, or my brother, but it's me, O oh Lord, and I need you, God. Make these gifts come alive.